Hello, we're here with Andrew Grant Houston, who is running for Seattle mayor. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Gomez. My name is Andrew Grant Houston, also known as ACE, and I am an architect who moved to Seattle to build housing. I moved here at the end of 2016, so right after that election, really coming to a place where I could not just live a great urban lifestyle and feel welcome as a queer individual and a queer person of color, but also to help champion more housing and progressive uh, policies and beliefs, which I felt that Seattle is seen as the leader in. Unfortunately, when moving here, I realized how hard it is to build housing and how hard it is actually to make progress in the city. And after years of activism and combined with my own difficulty in dealing with my business through this pandemic, I grew frustrated. Um, especially at the last wildfires that we had in September, where the city said it had 95 shelter spaces for 5,500 unsheltered people. And so I am running to be a change candidate to truly push Seattle to be the city that it says it is, to make uh, amends and to fulfill our promises that we have set for ourselves as we try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by as much as possible and build housing so that everyone has a place where they can live affordably and be able to thrive in our city. And so I hope for your vote and for your endorsement as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. And so uh, now we'll move into the prepared questions. And again, these responses are uh, two minutes in length and I'll remind you uh, as we go through. And the speaking or the question order, everyone, uh, that I have is uh, Sherry, Nicole, Summer, and then Jeff. So here's question one. Summer? I'm sorry, Sherry? Hi. Um, what specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and long term? Please address land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, services, the role of the police and justice system. So I think this really comes back to where we are currently right now. And that is that we have nearly 12,000 people within the county that are either unhoused or unsheltered. And as much as our crisis is a regional issue, it is something where a lot of it came from our choice as a city to not allow more people to live here and our exclusionary land use policies. And so we have exacerbated that problem as we have said yes, yes, yes to more jobs, but no to more housing. And so coupling that with the amount of interactions that unhoused population has with the police, which I find to be unnecessary, that in order to address these two crises, we need to provide housing for people. And so I am focused on creating permanent affordable housing. That said, I recognize that as an architect, that if we were to cut every bit of red tape tomorrow, it would still take three years in order to build that housing. And so I am focused on creating 2,500 tiny homes as the short-term solution to um, be the interim process by which we then move people into permanent affordable housing. And when it comes to zoning, I am interested in eliminating exclusionary zoning across the city, recognizing that we need to allow for more people to live in all of our neighborhoods and recognizing that in our regressive taxation system, all of that new housing that we are going to build will actually pay sales tax through all the materials. Exactly. And so in that way, we are feeding back into our system and providing revenue for the additional services that we will be able to provide. Great, thank you. Um, put a question two into the box. Nicole, are you available? Yeah, I can ask this question. Um, what is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements like redlining, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? Do you support and would you sign city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? 
Yes, 100%. And we're not just going to do what Berkeley did, which was to sign a resolution in support of ending it. We are actually going to end it through our next major comprehensive plan process, which will be starting this fall. Also a heads up that it's going to be delayed a little bit. And I just know that because of my housing activism, as well as my current role as the interim policy manager for uh, council member Teresa Mosqueda. Something that I recognize from my own professional experience is that as a former land use code writer, that there are a lot of very nuanced pieces that go into a land use code that prevent us from creating the housing that we know that we need. And so not only am I interested in ending exclusionary zoning across the entire city of Seattle, and that means in every single neighborhood, I am also interested in reducing the complexity of our land use code. Because if we are actually going to build at the scale that we need to, we need for current landowners to be able to understand what they can even build on their property. And in that way, we also create a more accessible way for people to develop their own generational wealth and ensure that it's not just people who can afford to hire an architect like me that are able to build wealth, it's anyone within the city. Great, thank you so much. Uh, question three, uh, Summer. Would you, would you decrease the Seattle Police Department budget, and if so, by approximately what percentage? What is your plan for the city SPOG negotiations? Do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? First portion, yes, by at least 50%, recognizing that since 2010, the Seattle Police Department budget has been nearly double. And so what we're saying is that as much as we try to increase the funding, expecting an increase in public safety, we have not received that. And so we need to go back to that number and say, we are going to reset and divest from that model in order to invest in community-led alternatives. In terms of the SPOG negotiations, I recognize that that is going to be a multi-year process. However, I am not interested in signing a contract where Mike Solon is still the president. It has been extremely clear, both from his actions as well as the, what I would say, reduction in um, visceral attacks and responses in the US in general after President Trump was removed is that sometimes you need to take the person out who's currently in charge that has defended a lot of the bad actions in order to actually see progress and see reform. And so I see his removal as paramount to that reform that needs to happen within the, what will remain of the Seattle Police Department. With relation to qualified immunity, yes, I will support and advocate for ending qualified immunity. I think it's one of the ways that we not only keep our community accountable, but also make sure that police are accountable wherever they do decide to work. Great, thank you. Uh, question number four, and sorry, I lost my list, uh, Jeff. It's me, yeah. All right, how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars? Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? So I'm gonna tackle this in a number of different ways. And where I come from this is as someone who was raised by a single parent, I actually never had the opportunity to learn how to drive. And so I get everywhere within the city of Seattle, either by walking or by taking bus or light rail or sometimes the uh, Capitol Hill streetcar. So when it comes to prioritizing transportation infrastructure, I am interested in restoring bus service as quickly as possible to what it was pre-pandemic. So that once we do that, we are able to focus on a larger county-wide initiative so that we can provide the funding that is necessary in order to achieve our Metro Connects plan, which is supposed to be by 2040, but I would love to see that push to be by 2030. And for me, that really comes down to recognizing that we need to shift away from car usage as single occupancy vehicles being driven in the city of Seattle account for over 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions within the city. In terms of other investments in uh, 
pedestrian and uh, biking facilities, I am really focused on first and last mile connections. So really making sure that people can get safely to and from transit, as well as creating uh, what I know uh, council member Mosqueda likes to call Allegra bikes uh, facilities or AAA bikes, which is all ages facilities. So that it doesn't matter whether you're eight years old or 80 years old, you'll, you feel safe riding your bike down the street. In terms of prioritizing funds, I am most interested in prioritizing funds so that we can establish uh, reliable bus service. And so that means uh, painting the town red in bus lanes and painting the town green in bike lanes. Uh, and then in terms of those priorities, after that, starting to reform our parking usage so that commercial vehicles can find easy ways to park um, and putting personal vehicles at the bottom of that priority list. Great, thank you. So now we'll move into uh, follow-up questions from our board members and uh, the responses to these questions would be one minute in length. Um, so board members, are there any additional questions you would like to ask? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so um, I love your platform. Um, for mayor, now this is an executive role, it's an administrator role, it's yes. a figurehead role, it's like all this other stuff. So. Besides policy, like what in your background do you believe prepares you for sort of the job itself, if you know what I mean? So I would say that it really comes down to my experience as an architect. So I think most people believe that an architect is 90% design when that's actually about 10% of what we do. The 90% of what we do is project management. And so as someone who has managed multi-million dollar projects because I specialize in multifamily housing, I have experience in terms of managing teams and bringing projects in on time and under budget. Great, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, Mayor Kelly. Thanks. Um, I was hoping you could speak about how you would prioritize making our city more accessible for people with disabilities, um, intellectual mm -hmm. and developmental disabilities along, as, along with physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I think that really comes down to retaking our right of way and starting to reestablish space for people to be able to safely um, walk, bike and roll across the city. And with that, I would also love to see the development of additional uh, park space as well as community centers. And so in that way, provide more physical spaces for people to be able to gather and engage in their communities. I definitely am someone who recognizes the challenges that come with being um, differently abled, as well as that kind of thinking that has to go into architecture. And so hopefully to be able to bring that forward so that it's not just inside buildings, but outside of buildings as well. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Folks, time to think. All right. Um, so I have one. Uh, so I know that you wouldn't, uh, in a mayoral role, you wouldn't be leading public schools, but mm. how would you support its leadership? So I think we need to have some clear expectations and understanding between Seattle Public Schools and the city. And I think one of the biggest things that comes to my mind is the fact that there's currently no school downtown and I definitely want to see one happen. So I do have a belief that hopefully we could use our eminent domain powers as the city to acquire land so that we can establish a school downtown. Um, that is something that I am definitely interested in as we allow for more housing across our city is that we need to be able to support uh, families to be able to live in all of our neighborhoods and that of course will mean more cities. And so there should be that coordination between ourselves as an entity that's able to acquire land and an entity like Seattle Public Schools. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Yes, oh, Mary Kylie, go ahead. Is it okay if I asked you? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, I would love to hear um, more of your plans on how you would work with King County to have more bus service in the city of Seattle and um, of course payment for that. <laughs> yes. So I am being very direct with people that I want to bring back car taps to the level that they were before. So that brings uh, putting that back on the ballot in 2022. 
so that once we do organize and create a countywide initiative, which would ideally be 2023 or 2024, that we could then use that additional VLF funding to really focus our own um, our own investments within the city to bring down frequency from 15 minutes everywhere to ideally less than 10, ideally lower to six. And so in that way, really coordinating between the city and the county. I have a lot of heart in that Chair Balducci just directed King County Metro to identify how much money it would take in order to uh, achieve our countywide okay. emissions goals. And so with that, um, just additional coordination and of course supporting that great planning that's being done at that level. Okay, thank you. Further questions? I have one uh, submitted by our environmental committee. Um, how would you use uh, your office to address climate justice, um, ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions such as multimodal clean transportation options for mm -hmm. Washington residents? So I believe that climate justice is housing justice. And if we are trying to create a 15 minute city, then we need to create complete communities where everyone can have all the things that they need within their city. As I tell other people just offhandedly, the barista in Magnolia should be able to afford a place to live in Magnolia. And that should be the same case for any worker in any neighborhood. When it comes to my policies, I think the biggest one is the income tax that I really want to push, which is the just transition tax that would go to four major things that would be green apprenticeships. So we need additional workers in order to build all the housing that we need. Um, a money into the equitable development initiative up to $100 million so that Black, Indigenous and other communities of color are able to define their own communities and housing. Um, it would go into business and occupation tax relief because that's one of the easiest ways we can help small businesses. Okay. And the last bit is, which I'm like blanking on right now, would go towards, I've forgotten, I'm sorry. It's okay. I can actually, <laughs> if you would like to talk about that for an additional minute, I'm fine with that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go ahead. As I like quickly get to it. So, oh, and into a, um, what I'm calling a green building public development authority. I am someone who is a certified passive house designer. And the way that passive house works is that you try to reduce the amount of energy that a building uses by up to 90%. And so by creating a public development authority that is focused on not just building green housing and green buildings, but also educating professionals within the community, we are helping to one, become a clean tech capital which means that we are at the forefront of a major movement of green building, but that we also help educate people and um, are able to disperse that information so that we can build quickly within the amount of time that we have until 2030. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions? I have another one uh, okay. that has to do with collaboration uh, across the um, you know corridor corridor or with our, our neighboring cities. Um, yes. How would you go about that? So I think we need to really leverage our community regional councils. Um, it is something where I recognize currently working for a council member that all of our current council members sit on a number of different boards and committees that are able to really collaborate at this on the flip side, also recognizing where power lies. So I currently sit as a board member for FutureWise. We were able to pass House Bill 1220, which now requires every jurisdiction that plans under the Growth Management Act to plan for not just housing as in just regular multifamily and single family, but also permanent supportive housing as well as other types of uh, shelter for unhoused individuals. And so in that way, really recognizing that by making that big push, we are requiring that our neighbors also help us in this regional crisis. Thank you. Right in time too. Uh, Barbara, go ahead. And okay. this will be our final question from the board members before we go into the re recap or mm -hmm. go ahead, Barbara. So I, I'm uh, really impressed. I'm, I'm a landscape architect retired oh. and I'm really 
impressed with how the green building movement is um, uh, directing your thoughts in your platform and I like it a lot. And mm -hmm. I, um, I've been working on the Seattle parks and open space for many, many, many years. And I, when I came into Seattle in the 1980s, mm -hmm. the mission of the city and the parks was to complete the, you know, the neighborhood and public parks. We noticed that they were unequally distributed and there was a yes. whole community center building. Now, um, much of the Emerald Necklace and the park system is crumbling from mm -hmm. deferred maintenance and deferred funding. So I'm interested to hear you talk about not the new ideas, but how would you prioritize and how would you um, get people on your side to refund maintaining mm -hmm. and improving the spaces that we already have because they are literally crumbling. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the use that we have now, um, you know, is just uh, stressing them to the max. So mm -hmm. put your um, maintenance, uh, you know, maintenance of the ne the green necklace on and, and talk to us about that. Yep. Well, I do want to give a shout out to the Olmsted brothers and of course the work that they did do across the city, knowing that history. I took a lot of landscape architecture history courses when I was at the University of Texas and very appreciative of my professors there. What I would really want to focus on in terms of priorities, one of them being establishing an office of the urban forest. So in that way, recognizing that currently we don't pay people to take care of our trees. And if we are going to not just take care of our existing trees, but also hopefully increase our canopy, we need to actually pay experts to help with that navigation and treat the city like a forest. I've so been saying that for 30 years. <laughs> well, I'm listening to you right now. <laughs> and, I, and I want to do it. Um, I, one of the, the biggest things in my mind when it comes to a lot of the things that the city wants to do is that we just make volunteers do it. And I don't find that acceptable, especially as a person of color who is asked to volunteer all the time. And so we actually need to pay people to do the things that we want, which includes park maintenance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so if you would like to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up, mm -hmm. now go ahead. So I would say in this era of the Green New Deal where we must make life-changing investments in our infrastructure, in our city, and in our people, that we need someone who has lived experience of just trying to get by during this pandemic, a lifelong renter, but also someone who has the professional experience of an architect and a project manager to be able to execute all of these visions and really recognize the intersectionality that comes to them. And so I hope that with your support and with your endorsement, we are able to come together and build this rising tide that will lift all boats, starting with those at the bottom first. Thank you. Thank you.